All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Better this way. Very close. Nice. That makes it exciting. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, remember, defragment yourself. See if there's any seat next to you. There's more people coming in. So I'm here to talk about console. Uh, thank you very much for the segue, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Uh, so first of all, who am I? Uh, why I'm here and why do you think I know anything about this? So my name is Mark. I'm uh, from Barcelona. So I'm more used to partying than computing. No, I'm joking. Uh, I, I don't party at all. So I'm a grumpy engineer by definition, so as is admin. Uh, I live in London right now. I've been uh, I co-founded a company called Ulcan Cherry that we're not doing too much, but it makes some money, so it's good. I hope I can do more about that. I'm the head of operations at a small startup called Gluru, which is card herding for developers, which is nice. I worked in the past in, um, in Ubuntu. I contributed to Ubuntu, I contributed to M Collective, to Puppet as well. Uh, and uh, I architected what I was working uh, for Canonical, uh, something called Mass which is very nice, and I helped architect something called Juju, which I might have to ask forgiveness about. Um, <laughs> I, I helped uh, build also a DevOps team at Rackspace, uh, which is very cool. Now they can use the word DevOps with what they do. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I've been doing DevOps for five years. Um, so apart from doing all these, I, I like to contribute to the community because I think that if I'm here and I'm making money out of this and I'm having a good time is thanks to everyone in this room and everyone in all the other rooms in this conference as well. So I help organize a meetup in London called London DevOps. Uh, so if you're around London, uh, we normally do it every second week of the month. Uh, we try to talk about interesting topics or, or at all levels, so from uh, basic things like how to install configuration management to all the way to uh, talks like the one I gave at Fosdem last year, which is abstraction of metadata across different providers. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I have stickers here uh, from the meetup, so if you want to come uh, forward later, you, you might get some for your laptop. It's good. So what is Console? Uh, so Console uh, was created uh, by HashiCorp, by this very talented guy called Mitchell Hashimoto that created the company. And looks like he also got good taste in logos. So henceforth, that C there is a logo for console. And console in introduction is a service discovery system. So it helps you discover all your stuff, right? You, especially when you're working in, in the cloud or in any kind of environment that mutates all the time. You don't want to be editing and touching and retouching all the time where your services are. So you need something like this that automatically discovers them from you and gives you an easy way to access that. So for people here that haven't used Service Discovery before, uh, which I hope will be just one or two of you tops, um, this is how it works. Uh, you have different services providing the same node, uh, the same, uh, sorry, different nodes providing the same service. And all of them then publish to a, a meta framework of source called the service publication. And that can be browsed and queried by everyone around and to know exactly which machines or which servers or which uh, containers or are the ones that have this. If you want to put this a bit more in depth, just a bit more, uh, you have in reality what you have is the service running on a node, which is checked by a health check that you define just to make certain that you're not running a service that is for any reason not right. And uh, if the health checks passes, yay, then it goes to the discovery agent uh, this, uh, who is responsible for publishing this into the service publication service. And normally, if you want to have a good minus and good behaviors on that, the discovery agent will also try to uh, check sanity of all other the discovery uh, agents. So they keep a quorum and they know where all of them are. Because if one of them goes down for any reason, uh, you won't know what happens with that node, which is a bad thing. So how does this translate in console? So in console, the way you, uh, it's translated is that you have a set of servers that are called the console servers, and uh, these servers maintain a quorum, right? So it's the same quorum as, as you want with anything else. The minimum recommended is three, <coughs> if, uh, in order to avoid split brain scenarios. Uh, you can go with one or two, but your mileage may vary. I, I don't really recommend that. And 
those three talk amongst themselves to share all the metadata and information and the bands they have, and they choose a leader amongst themselves, which can change at any point in time. And then you have all your clients that consume all their information, and these clients sit on every single node that you have on your, on your platform. And let's say that you have enough money or you, you like to be in different geographical regions. Uh, you want to have that same thing again in another geographical region, right? So you have, again, another set of console servers. And how do you they communicate? So the way they communicate is uh, through uh, one gossip. So there's two different levels of gossip. Gossip is a protocol uh, that uh, was created for SERP. And it's a, it's a standard protocol of communicating events across the space. And inside your uh, data center space, you just align gossip because you have a local network. It's very fast. You can communicate anything you want. Whereas uh, for uh, communicating with all the data centers, uh, you use one gossip which uh, has in mind all the, um, I would say, all the latency that you uh, inject between two different data centers. And I really like this. It's, it's very cool and vendor proofs as well. So I'll go a little bit more in depth of uh, what kind of functionality console gives to you. So it gives you all these things. And all these different things uh, can also be provided by other tools. So, for example, uh, the key value storage that it has is actually strongly consistent key value storage, but uh, it's something that you could also get with EDCB. Uh, it publishes DNS for you, which you could do if you have Zookeeper, and Zookeeper doesn't explode on your face. Uh, it publishes service. Uh, it does health checks, like your monitoring will do. And it exposes all of these through an HTTP RESTful API, which I really like, because I, who doesn't like JSON here? And it does all of this on top with encryption, which is great, because I don't trust anyone. So I'll go one by one, uh, not to bore you, so I'll try to go as fast as possible. Uh, the console DNS provider listens on a very weird port, port 8600. Uh, it, pr it exposes all the different services and all the different nodes, so mostly all the catalog that console has. And if you're like me and lazy and you don't want to query port 8600, uh, you can use the NS mask, uh, which uh, suggested by Gareth Rushgrove. Thank you very much, by the way. Uh, you can just add that line into the NS mask in every single local machine, and you will have the dot .console region, which is what console exposes. As your in your local DNS queries, which is neat. So how does this translate? So let's say that you have a service that is called Web, just to be creative, and you're in a zone. In this case, I'm in Amazon, uh, so it's the Ireland zone, EU West one. So console will fill in the gaps. Uh, the gaps are their service name and zone. So you will look for a service called web.service.eu.west1.console, which is very good because you want to talk with that service web on that data center, which uh, can differ from another data center that you can look into. And it will always give you the list, a uh, round robin list of all the nodes and all the IPs that provide that service. And the same happened for the nodes. So you all the nodes in console have a unique name, and uh, they all live in a zone as well. So you can query all the different nodes and know exactly which IP they have by looking it at it this way. So you don't have to do all these things that I used to do as publishing a a secret DNS zone in my provider of choice, so I can query all my servers. All of this is provided by console, which is nice. And all of these things that the DNS provides are also provided by the API with even more depth, which is amazing. So you can uh, query the V1 catalog endpoint of the, of the API, which we'll look at later. And if you uh, download the presentation later, you can try all of these different ones, and all of them work and give you extra information. It also has a key value storage. Uh, and this is incredibly important because if you heard my rant last year, not it was more a rant than a presentation, about lack of coherency of metadata across different providers, this kind of solves that. Um, this key value store is, uh, as I said, strongly consistent, so you can rely on it, and I do, and it hasn't failed on me so far, so that's good. And you can put any kind of information you want in any kind of structure you want. So it's kind of like Zookeeper without all the horrible Python libraries. And the only thing is that it's limited, uh, each key is limited to 156 kilobytes. And that's only because uh, someone in the mailing list tried to use uh, console as, uh, as an S3 server, literally. 
and started uploading files there, which can be done, but it's not the best idea. Yeah, sorry. The value. Yeah, sorry. He asked if it was the key or the value. It, it was the value. There you go. So the next thing is a service publication. So this is the way you configure your service in order to publish it. Uh, you can add, uh, as all of this is in the key value store, you can add tags as well. So you can tag your service so you can look at a different sub, uh, I would say, sub service inside the same service uh, if you want to do that in any way which is very helpful. You define the port as well, which will be exposed through the API, so you can recover the API and inject that port as metadata into your checks. And you can put a simple health check script, uh, which in this case will run every 10 seconds. So what this script will do is that it will run, and if it's, uh, if it's okay, every 10 seconds it will say, yeah, the service is okay, the service is okay. And it will keep publishing that service. So an example of that would be our, our infamous web service, we have it on three servers, so all of them are passing, everything's cool. But I decided to upgrade PHP. Yeah, I know, I use PHP, sorry. Um, I decided to upgrade PHP, so I have to stop uh, Apaching one of the servers. But I don't tell console because I'm just like that and lazy and grumpy. So when that happens, in less than 10 seconds, console will discover that uh, that service is not available anymore because the check will not pass and it will remove that IP from the list of IPs in the round in the round robin query. And then when I finish upgrading PHP, and I'm happy about that, I start it again, and in less than 10 seconds, that server will come back to life, which is neat. I really like that, and it makes me more lazy. There's some dangers to this, though. The console doesn't have a minimum number of servers that can run a service. so. If you go from lazy to lazier, you can ha have no service, literally. And that happened to me once. Puppet. Oh. Um, so also, your checks need to be solid. So if you say that this, the check needs to run in 10 seconds, or every 10 seconds you run the check, please make sure that this the check itself runs in less than 10 seconds. Make sure, because <laughs> otherwise, it's fun. So the same goes for the health checks. So the distinction in console between service health checks and health checks is that the health check itself just checks the, is the general health of the machine. So it's not related to any service that you publish. It just checks that the machine has enough disk, enough memory, that the CPU is not melting, stuff like that. So, and it follows exactly the same configuration parameters, right? You have an ID, you put it in name, you run your script and you say that it runs every 10 seconds, which is great, it checks that the machine is healthy. Uh, but also, again, it has caveats. And one of them I discovered myself. I wanted to run everything through console and put every single check. And now the problem is that I run in Amazon because I don't know better, and uh, I have a check that checks for the disk IO in Amazon. So who here wonders what happens when you try to ensure disk IO in Amazon? It doesn't work. So I discovered that the hard way when half of my servers relinquish themselves from duty. And this brings us to the monitoring question. So there's two schools of thought here. Um, there's people like uh, Hashikov themselves that use console as a general health check as well, and they use that as a monitoring platform. So console itself will, will page you, will wake you in the middle of the night, which is nice. Hey, my server discovery is doing something neat. It's waking me up. Uh, so, and there's other people that want more reassurement and want to have also monitoring platform on top of that. You do it whichever way you want, and it dep depends on how trusty are you of uh, having one monitoring system or two monitoring systems. But me personally, I run console and sensor, and both of them page me up, which uh, when the platform goes down, it's hilarious again. So as I said, I will go fast through that because I only have half an hour and I have a demo. Console uh, publishes everything through a RESTful API. And right now it's in V1, as you can see. It publishes all kind of information. Way too much information, I would even say. It gives you the flexibility to consult all these and to inject all these as metadata into different processes and services. It's just amazing. So if you uh, look later at this, I'll just, tell you key V is for the key value agent, 
uh, queries again against your local agent in your local machine. The catalog is just everything that console knows about everyone in that data center. Health is all about the health checks. Session is about your current session, so you can even run sessions inside console and uh, invalidate them if the data changes. And ACL and status are self-explanatory, pretty much. So in order to run all of these, uh, console also provides uh, a way of providing encryption. So I would say it's quite smart that it uses encryption in two different ways. So it encrypts the gossip protocol separated from the all the rest of op operations through RPC. So in order to encrypt the gossip uh, protocol, it uses a KPI encryption. So and console itself provides you a key generator for that, just to ensure that you, you're not messing it up like me because I'm clumsy like that. And you just type console cage and it will give you a new key and these will be used to encrypt all the communications across your cluster of console servers. And for all the rest of operations, you want to be a bit more, uh, I would say, a bit nicer. So you can use RPC uh, and you can use TLS on top of RPC which is nice, it's supported, everyone knows about it, yeah. and it's good. I, I tried, by the way, I tried to find an image here that was hilarious and, and fishy as I like, but I only found the boring diagram, so I'm sorry. So this is pretty much what console gives you. So on top of this, I would say there's a special mention that I would like to say is that you start thinking about all the things that console can do and start having ideas, some good, some bad, some horrible as mine. And and then uh, one of the things that console provides is one thing called console watch. So you start having all this metadata and all these things that change because your service publishing changes. So, and you want to start doing things like, what happens if I lose one of the servers? Do I want to execute a script on top of that? Do I want to, let's say, run a monitoring script that pages me if there's less than two servers in uh, one service? Because I want to make certain that if there's no server serving that, I'm at least woken up by it. You can do that. So in order to do that, there's this command. So it just runs as a daemon. It demonizes itself. And you specify what kind of uh, key do you want from the API. Do you want a, an event, a key value store, service, a node, a check? And you can add the parameters belonging to each one of the types. And then at the end, what kind of script will it run if the condition happens, if that changes? And it do does this using a good feature uh, which is the API blocking queries. And you can use these yourself as well. So if you want to implement uh, direct calls to the API, you can actually implement a blocking query uh, request that will sit there for an N amount of seconds that you <coughs> specify waiting for a change. And this is all the functionality from console that I want to express today. There's also web UI, which is very nice. and um, I didn't bother to add it to here, so I'm sorry. Uh, so useful resources. So all of this is very neat. I, it's cool. I want to be able to use it, but I'm already running Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, an incredible array of bash scripts, whatever you want. And I want to integrate that there. So in order to do that, you can use these resources. Again, uh, if you download the presentation later, you can just click through them. Um, there's very, very good support from both Puppet and Chef. So if you go to the Chef supermarket, there's an incredibly good, and uh, by incredibly good, I mean incredibly good, well-documented, which is rare, module for console there. And in the, uh, in the Puppet Forge, there's a module to configure console made by Carl Anderson. And there's another module to connect your higher metadata to console, which I wrote myself, just because I said, I, I really like connecting all these different metadata servers. There's also a couple uh, modules for Ansible. I have tried both of them and I can't decide which one of them I like more. So I just put the link to both of them here and you choose. And I tried really hard to find something for a salt stack. I didn't find it. So if, y if you can give me the, uh, the URL later so where I can look at it, I will just publish it in the presentation. On top of all of these, there's also extra tools. Uh, some of them provided by HashiCorp themselves. So one of them is called Env Console, which publishes uh, environment variables with uh, metadata that you can get from console. So whenever you run a shell script or something similar, you can start recovering all this metadata from, from console and populate your script or populate your program with that. There's a console replicate as well, which serves to replicate all the data uh, across. 
Uh, so it, it's for cross data center replication. And console template, which does something similar to ConfD, similar in some ways different, but similar, uh, which is that it stores templates of your configuration files, it listens using API blocking queries to console, and if something changes, it will repopulate the template and restart the service. And this is very useful for something like Nginx, where uh, you want to publish IPs of your backends of your different services, and uh, one of them goes down, you want that to be a refresh as fast as possible. So this is a very good tool for that. And apart from HashiCorp, there's other people doing very cool stuff. Uh, so I said ConfD uh, by Kelsey Hightower does the same thing, but co for console and for etcd. There's a consulate as well, which is a Python library, so you can bind your Python programs to this. The script that encrypts the config parameters in your key values though, because you don't want to keep your passwords in the clear, right? Uh, there's a docker console, uh, which is self-explanatory. It helps using console to uh, manage your docker containers. And there's a, con a console registrator, which helps you register services that are run by, uh, docker, um, by docker containers. As I said, all of them are very nice. It's very well integrated with Docker, uh, even if uh, I would say CoreOS favors more etcd and confd and flip, just because they have, I, I would say, a bit more of uh, their hands in it. But yeah, so I'll run a quick demo. Hopefully it won't crash, but I'm just telling you before time that it might. So <coughs> there we go. So everybody can see that or it's way too small? You in the back can see, can read that proper? Bit bit bigger like that, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, if you want, no worries. Let me just try. Oh, it might fail though. Yep. One second and bring that. I see out. Wait, wait. <laughs> one sec. See, it's it's already crashing. Damn it. Um. <coughs> That's better. Thank you. All right, so, okay. Now I just need to get my script. So I already, um, I cheated a little bit because I don't trust the network at Forstem. So I already, no, I disappeared again, damn it. There you go. So I already uh, started up uh, this, so you can download it from my GitHub. It's a set of four uh, machines running in Vagrant. Three of them are console servers using very little memory, I, I can show you. And one of them is a server called web. <coughs> so I'm going to secure share into the uh, web server. Uh, maybe if I go to the right directory, that would could work. Uh, one sec. There you go, that's better. Takes a while. That's what happens with demos, right? I always say, let's try a demo. This time it won't crash. <sighs> Should I know better? Okay. I think I'm not connecting anywhere, so DNS is giving me the, the finger, literally. Sick. All right. So I, I give up on the demo. See, I told you it would crash. So it's a very neat demo. Uh, if you download it from GitHub in the README, uh, you have all the steps that I would actually have done. So if you replay that yourself and imagine that actually happened here, that would be amazing. 
So if you want to know more, uh, these are would be my favorite places to go. Uh, the console documentation is incredibly good, very well maintained, which is rare in a, in a community project, but it's amazing. I really like that. The console mailing list has, it doesn't have too much traffic, so don't worry, it's not like the chef users one or like the puppet users one that I skim through because I can't read every single email. This one, you can actually read them and it's fine. And the open issues for console, just in case something doesn't really work the way you want it, or like me that's paranoid, it's like, are you certain this works this way? You can go there and check if somebody else thought about that. And that's it. I can't believe I actually finished on time. So any questions you may have, um, the presentation is already up on SlideShare because I uploaded it from home. Uh, the GitHub, uh, my GitHub is there, so you can download the demo that didn't work. And if you want to read my blog posts, that's my blog as well. So thank you. And questions? Any? Any questions? Come on. Yes. Uh, you talked about the subscription. Yes. Yes. So the question was if everything is encrypted. So yeah, um, the communication between the servers to ensure that they are alive, that's through gossip. So this is PKI for encryption. And uh, uh, all the other operations that you do that requires uh, an APC operation that console supports, uh, that requires, uh, uh, I would say, SSL and TLS and creating your own CA and stuff like that. But yeah, everything's encrypted. And you can always talk to your local uh, console agent in an unencrypted way if you want, because who, who sniffs localhost anyway? Uh, but yeah, it, it works. So the question is that if you can uh, securely encrypt uh, uh, keys and values, yes you can. You need to use the uh, console encryptor that I showed before. So what you do is that you define, it's kind of, I would say, the chicken and the egg. How do you inject a, K, a KPI key that is secure in order to encrypt something in a way that they can see the KPI key? So it's it's kind of chicken and the egg, but the way you do it is that you use that to encrypt all your communications. Uh, you can use a KPI, you can use other stuff, and uh, you should keep the key secure as usual. Yes. So the question is, uh, you said that uh, all these different checks, that uh, where they run and how do you can see all of them through the UI. So there's different ways to see these. If the demo actually worked, you could see that there's this thing called uh, console monitor that will just throw you the stream of events <coughs> and it will tell you every single time a check passes. Uh, so you can do that if you like common line as myself, but it will also show in the, on the UI. Yeah, uh, on top of that, I use sensor as well. Just because I use sensor before I use console, so it it just me that I can't I can't just let go of sensor. All right. Yes. More questions. So uh, the question is that if the um, is the API is the uh, is the publish API will actually allow you to inject services yourself? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So you can add extra information apart from that. I don't know. Uh, but I will. When I need to do that, what I do is that I use the key value store because everything is written anyway in the key value store. You just need to look into a different branch, branch of the key value store in a certain way. But yeah, you could add the extra information if you wanted. All right, any more questions? Yes? Um, the question is if you back up the state of your, of your key value store in console, uh, you could. And you just gave me a great idea for another project, thank you. Uh, but it's, I would say it's not really necessary. It's strongly consistent, so it exists in every single node. So the only way to lose information is to kill every single one of your nodes. Yes. What are the ways to store your database and your system? So, so what are the connections between my metadata talk, that my metadata rant more than talk that I released last year and this? So 
the, co the connections is that uh, last year was complaining whining here about the lack of coherency between different systems. So Puppet exposes some metadata. Uh, Amazon, if you run on a virtual machine, or, or, or Docker exposes some metadata. But there's nobody that gets all the metadata together and coherent, uh, because that creates a split brain scenario where you need to look at the metadata in five different places, which is not ideal. So this solves that a little bit, but you, need sti you still need to do the extra effort you still need to do the extra effort to um, to go and inject all of this into the key value store. So it's halfway there. Yeah. All right. Last question. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what is the performance of console if it works properly and you can stress it out and it doesn't consume your CPU? The answer is that so far I have abused it to death and it hasn't really consumed almost anything because it's all written in Go, uh, which does a very good threading and memory management. So as I said, uh, I run blocking queries that have been very heavy and the system has not even suffered from that. All right. Any other questions? You can find me uh, in the. Thank you. Thank you.